Good evening. This is Marasha Lasson for Ericsson, and now we're going to sing you an old traditional folk song. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had a fun project uh, for a couple of uh, weeks because we used to develop uh, and enhance our environment. <clears throat> we want to ensure hardware compatibility also. And I don't really like, or we don't like, the approach where we have servers somewhere away from us and uh, we need to book them or we need to write a ticket when we need to reconfigure them. And then anyway, if they go down, we just cannot work on them. And both Lasse and myself, we're, we used to always code pretty close to the hardware. So I really do like to touch the hardware I'm working on. And finally, I came up with an idea just uh, to prove and test our software on our own machine. And because uh, usually our uh, desktop environment or the notebooks are not powerful and not configurable enough, I started picking up uh, parts over the internet. So I spent something like two weeks ordering uh, parts, all from legal sources. And the outcome was this uh, tiny server. We call it safety orange, obviously, because of the color. And for a few weeks, it served me really well as a traffic generator, as a test and development environment. So I could do all my compilation running the VMs. And uh, it was awesome. So really, uh, after a while, uh, many people came to me. Uh, in our company. Actually, I want that too. So now uh, we can order five, five of those. It will be fun to assemble all those uh, <clears throat> machines. So I wanted to add this color because we wanted to use it also for uh, demo purposes. Um, we have the layer we used to talk about. It's a bit like God. Everybody knows that it exists, but nobody has seen that before. And we try to make use of it in, in, in many different ways. So I wanted to have a virtual router on a pen drive <clears throat> and uh, which adopts to any environment. It means I start off a routing engine on one hardware. It runs, it can be configured, it forwards traffic. OK, I shut it down, go to the next hardware, which is completely different. It starts up, it runs, it detects uh, all the resources. DPDK can use and makes use of them. And there was an interesting thing that typically in uh, the small form uh, PCs <coughs> with mini ITX uh, motherboard form factor, uh, those motherboards uh, support only a single PCIe uh, slot with uh, by 16 PCI lanes. And typically the cards we use 2 by 10 or even 2 by 40, <coughs> we actually uh, just 1 by 40 is active they don't make use of uh, 16 PCI lanes. And for that reason, uh, I tried PCI bifurcation, where when a motherboard supports uh, splitting the PCI devices, then two devices could be added, two by eight uh, PCI devices. So this is the hardware list where uh, the tiny of the shelf uh, mini ITX motherboard uh, I've used a low-power uh, Xeon CPU with 14 uh, physical cores because of the cooling and the, and the noise. I also wanted to use, and I used this uh, computer in our office environment where I definitely wanted it to be quiet. So it's much more silent than uh, a fully loaded uh, notebook. It has uh, 32 G of memory, uh, four channels, because I didn't want to have uh, any restriction on the memory side. So Typically, the mini ITX motherboards come with uh, two DIMM slots, memory slots. This one has four, so I can use all the four memory channels. I have the PCI riser splitter cable for the bifurcation. And actually, this one has two X710 uh, line cards. So it means I have uh, at the back plane total of uh, four 40G uh, ports, physical ports. And the case. I was particular about it because I wanted to have it in the office environment and I wanted to find something which looks pretty cool and I just like it. So this is about the bifurcation where uh, I, I tried both uh, 40 to 90 cards and the interesting thing is that the bifurcation can be split, fur uh, split further. So if, uh, if the motherboard itself supports, I could even use uh, four devices. 
Of course, in that case, uh, for a, a four-digit NIC, it will be a, a bottleneck. I think by eight uh, means that even a 50G NIC can be supported or just uh, barely limited by the PCI bandwidth. So the test setups we used were uh, when Safety Orange ran the whole virtual router, it means that we both had the control plane running there and the forwarding. And a completely different uh, machine was a traffic generator. I actually used uh, DPDK's package gen uh, because that's also a fun part. We have this layer and uh, DPDK package gen basically is using uh, DPDK as, <coughs> as all the typical and the, the example app applications. It means that I myself can turn uh, any of our VMs into a package generator. So because we have this abstraction, it doesn't matter if it's a regular Ericsson application runs on top of it or this is the package gen. And it's pretty cool because it means uh, even in a cloud environment, you can just fire up a, a VM or a traffic generator wherever you want to. But to fully uh, measure the performance, <coughs> I also ran uh, a test where we isolated uh, the control plane and the forwarding plane, also with the traffic generator. And uh, this is all because, uh, as Laszlo and Tom was also referring to our previous works, we have this uh, abstraction layer. And I give the clicker to Laszlo to <coughs> cover some of the features. Yeah, so actually, I mean, these presentations were three years ago, and we're still not upstreaming anything, which we <laughs> feel a bit sorry. I mean, really sorry of, of that. But hopefully something will happen, because I mean, now we have this uh, strategy of open sourcing. So <laughs> hope that soon something will happen. So, so we were talking about this abstraction layer already, like three years ago. We, we did, so this abstraction layer, is, it's, it's not just abstracting your memory, as I we try to explain in previous presentation, but it's abstracting the way you are accessing a queue or uh, the, the CPU topology or the resources. So in this model, the application just describes their model, and then then you can just uh, yeah, it's hard to <laughs> hard to tell all this in in a few minutes. I mean, it's a, it would be a longer talk, but. But basically, you just describe the resource requirements of a single instance, and then you can just scale that up uh, easily. Like uh, we're, all of this is based on a pool of resources. Like a, a, yeah, CPU can be put into pools, so then you can have your I/O pools, uh, you can have your uh, packet processing pools or whatever, and the queues are also the same thing. Application just tells, give me my queue. It doesn't care. I mean, most of the application doesn't really care if that queue is a Virtio queue or what is the packet pool behind uh, or what, what kind of, uh, I mean, the offload uh, features. They just want to tell that, okay, I need to check some offload. And then you, the setting up the queues, it's, it's the responsibility of the platform. I think uh, more, uh, so this, uh, this problem is brought up in many of the presentations uh, and more and more presentations before us already. And, and the, the flexibility we need in this new environment or in this environment, what should, so we need to adapt to all these environments. And I think that's a key. I mean, we need to, we need to have this uh, way of uh, thinking where we, we, have a pub, we are just publishing the configuration based on the platform we are running. Like in a container, you may be publishing it, it, uh, the resources in a different way, the memory you attach. But the application, it doesn't have to be recompiled. It's just compiled once, and then you just run it, and then it just attaches to the resources, which are actually just named resources, and then you, you just, uh, so you split the publishing and the consuming part. And that's, I think that's the key, and that's what should we should had had uh, to so yeah basically <laughs> okay thank you and uh, it's not that uh, hard to fulfill from the application's perspective uh, the requirements we set to them because basically there is only one thing uh, actually there's there are two so one is using our apis and the other one is uh, to scale the application must be able to scale if it it has uh, more resources so if the application detects through our API that, okay, there are five CPUs to use, then we expect the application to scale. If we tell them it is 44 CPUs, then we still expect the application to scale to 44 CPUs. 
this is one example, uh, typically, how uh, I uh, partitioned our CPUs. Initially, when uh, first we just ran without any basic configuration or fine tuning uh, our system, two CPU cores went, oh, this is the native mode because uh, there is no difference. So if an application already adopted to our layer, uh, it's completely abstracted from it, so the application doesn't know about if it's running uh, virtualized mode or native mode, what kind of interface they have. And, and, and so DPDK will see, uh, I mean, we are presenting a different world with DPDK. We don't, DPDK, uh, I mean, as is today, it just, uh, if it runs on Linux, then it's detecting the topology, and, but uh, through, I mean, we abstracted this, that as well, so the CPU topology is coming from our database, so basically we virtualize the world for DPDK, so that way, you can bring up multiple instances and just show what DPDK likes to see. Initially, the <coughs> two, two cores uh, were assigned to, to CPUs, uh, to, two, uh, to siblings of two different physical cores, and also the I.O. or the load balancer, as you wish. Uh, eight of them started, and all on uh, different CPUs, physical cores. And <coughs> Of course, uh, this didn't work well because uh, the execution units or the forwarding instances or the workers, as you wish, uh, they had a different performance because of this because the siblings were competing for the resources continuously and while uh, the background CPU or the control plane didn't eat too much, it means that the CPU or the uh, worker on CPU uh, 14 was pretty efficient because it didn't really have to compete for resources. On the other hand, like 21, which was competing with uh, number seven, uh, showed a completely different performance. And the ones, the physical core where the two siblings ran uh, the execution unit itself, had yet another performance. So after a while, uh, also checking uh, which element is the bottleneck, I reduced the amount of the IO threads to four from eight, because Initially, the workers absolutely were the bottlenecks. Uh, it was clearly seen. And also, I made uh, the backgrounds to run on the same physical core, so it means anything. The kernel and the, all the maintenance processes ran there, the first uh, physical core. And the IOs were running together also, and the workers had much cores, and they were all the same performance. And uh, this is, again, without changing anything in the application itself. No recompilation, nothing. I just changed the, our configuration, basically. And this one resulted a much better and a much balanced system. Uh, I just did an, uh, a trial to, to reduce the amount of IO cores to two, but in that case, obviously, the IO cores became the bottleneck. So it means that because the uh, four trail cards ran in the four, four by 10 modes, I had a total of eight uh, 10 G ports there, and, and uh, the IO threads, one IO thread pulled uh, two ports at the same time. Uh, this is just an example a screenshot of uh, the package gen where we really used all the, uh, all the eight uh, 10G ports with 740 byte packets. Uh, it could do almost uh, 80G, which is pretty cool. Hey, don't you happen to have a 80G traffic generator on your desk? Well, yeah, actually I have one. Uh, but we're thinking about to use it as a package gen because the other version of this board also has uh, Wi-Fi. It means that instead of using the, the really expensive uh, switches, layer two switches, or just doing a pretty long and uh, time-consuming recabling, you just walk there, put down next to the node you want to test, do the cabling, or even if we have m uh, more of these, like Laszlo has one and everybody else, then uh, we can just create really fast uh, a network, and we can bring up a test setup. And uh, this is also important, at least it was to me, that uh, the power consumption. In idle mode, it could have still uh, reduced a bit, but 35 watt is not that bad. It's not uh, really on the notebook level, but uh, compared to a server, it, it, it's really low power in, uh, when idling. And even on, on full load with the, uh, a bit above uh, 100 watts, uh, it was still the range of the uh, desktop replacement notebooks, which used to be really heavy, big, and loud when it's fully loaded, and it still was uh, pretty silent. Thank you. Any questions? We're here, and one over here. Okay, I saw, I saw you. 
You sure? Okay. Right. I don't know. You got it loud. How loud is it? Excuse me? How loud is it? Um, loud. It, is, it is not. Uh, usually in, in office environment, you cannot even hear it. It's, so it's just next to me, and I cannot realize that it's running. I mean, the other computers are louder than this one. So the other computers are around. So. Basically, what has happened is this is a 70 watt CPU, a low power one. On, on full load, it, it doesn't even uh, consume 70 watts. And I have a uh, vapor chamber uh, heating there, which is supposed to cool down even a 130 watt CPU. So on top of it, I have a slim uh, 12 centimeter um, fan, which really is uh, silent. So you won't realize it in an office environment that it's running. Okay, uh, so I, I think, uh, sorry, the question is from here. Uh, I think all the components were off the shelf. So how much does it cost, a single unit? I might have missed in the slides if you mentioned. Um, it really depends on the CPU you're, you're choosing. So uh, this so one was, without the network card, it was 1,700 bucks. Okay, 1700, 1700. Yes. Okay. 1700. All right, very good. Well, that concludes uh, day one program. You guys are amazing, uh, enduring uh, lots of great presentations, absorbing all this great information. Thanks to all our speakers today.